introduction. I I need you to uh, to write my synopsis on my website or something. That was perfect. Um, no, thank you so much, Christoph and Axel, for organizing this. Um, as I, I was talking with them, um, uh, you know, before we got started, and it just feels um, very humbling to be uh, associated and represented among um, all the amazing scientists that have been. Um, giving talks during this series and what what an amazing series so um definitely thank you guys so much for organizing and thank you everyone so much for showing up today um it's not super early for me but if you're on the west coast of the u.s i guess it's a little early but um and throughout the world uh you know different times of the day love it so anytime you can make time for good science hopefully you think my science is good um it's always a good day so um, I'll dive into it. Um, as, uh, as Christoph said, I just started at Marquette. So especially for anyone who's kind of navigating, um, you know, getting into uh, like the academic job market as well, transitioning between, um, you know, postdocs and uh, faculty positions. I just did that. So I'm also, please ask questions in that um, for that as well. Um, but just as Christoph mentioned, I'm exactly going to talk about um, all the levels of analysis today um, and how um, these different levels, molecular, individual behavior, group behavior, uh, come together and drive collective foraging behavior in honeybees. Before I get too deep into the science, of course, I want to acknowledge all the incredible people who make this science happen. Um, science gets done by a village, raising kids, doing science, uh, it all happens in groups. And so acknowledging all of my amazing advisors, Brian, Noah, um, I work closely with Jurgen Gadow as well. He was amazing um, in terms of the uh, RNA-seq and some of the more mole genetic molecular stuff you'll see. Um, and then I worked with Hong also to do the electrophysiology, but I especially want to shout out Jahit Ozturk. So Jahit actually did all of the um, bee breeding uh, and uh, bee inseminations that we did. Uh, he's an incredible human. And then of course, all of the undergraduate researchers um, who were out in the field with me doing all the field work. Uh, none of this would be, uh, I would do nothing and not be presenting anything without them. So um, huge shout out to them. So um, we're all, I think anyone who studies uh, social insects is just absolutely enthralled by collective behavior. Um, and that really is where my passion for um, diving into these levels of analysis happens. Um, so social animals are absolutely incredible in terms of accomplishing these really remarkable tasks and solving some complex ecological problems. Um, so for example, army ants literally building bridges with their bodies to, uh, to complete a foraging trail. Um, the, the top right photo I took myself of honeybees, I put this feeder out in the morning and by uh, noon, the feeder was absolutely swarmed. Um, and so it's really remarkable um, how bees can work together to find food. Um, of course, you have schooling in fish. These are barracuda. And then, of course, humans do this too, right? So the very distributed um, decision making in the stock market. And we're dealing with some of those decisions right now um, in terms of, uh, you know, not uh, the stock market dropping in the U.S. at least. Um, so we have these remarkable examples of collective behavior, um, but what really drives me is thinking about how the individuals are influenced by their environment and by the, by the ecological environment, by their social environment, and how that changes individuals and then how that scales to group behavior. So the central question to my talk today and to a lot of the research that I do is, how does variation in individual cognition, so what's going on in these individual brains in the interpretation of what's going on in their world, how does that scale to shape collective behavior? Um, so I'll talk today through these different levels of analysis. First, I'll talk about um, an individual level behavior that we identified in um, foraging honeybees, and then how their um, physiology differs between um, these different individual level uh, behaviors that we found. 
Um, so what's going on in their brains in terms of electrophysiology and uh, uh, gene expression, and then how that scales up to the collective. What is actually happening at the colony, right? So where the rubber meets the road, where um, the selection happens, uh, why do individuals have these behaviors um, when we think about real B world um, behavior? So let's get into it. So the individual behavior, um, first off, just a brief introduction to honeybees. So honeybees are a great model system for studying social behavior because they're relatively easy and cheap to get, especially here in the US. You just email someone and order some packages, they get you, they get delivered, you go pick them up. Um, and you can start colonies really easily. Um, they're easy to keep most people, most areas have experienced people. I hired an incredible uh, local beekeeper here in Milwaukee to keep my bees alive while I try to kill them all the time. Of course, when you do science and do some of our research, you have to sacrifice uh, some of your babes to um, get your research done. Um, but we've been working on, we have a great uh, beekeeper who does a good job keeping them alive mostly. Um, and of course they have very complex behaviors at the individual and the collective and their genome is mapped. So if you wanna do any genetic work, RNA-seq, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, qPCR, qTL analysis, they're fantastic um, systems for doing that. And um, as I mentioned, they exhibit complex behaviors. And uh, one of the most complex, kind of like cognitively complex behaviors that we think about is learning. Um, and one of the uh, specific types of learning behavior that we study and that I picked up from working with Brian Smith is a behavior called latent inhibition. And so latent inhibition is essentially a fancy way of saying learning to ignore familiar or unimportant stimuli. So if you're getting exposed to uh, stimuli, like for example, um, there's a event going off in my office and my brain has learned to ignore that. So that is unimportant information that fan poses no benefit or uh, detriment to me. So I've learned to ignore that. Um, and some people can't though. So I think that, uh, so even in, in humans, we recognize that people have different um, abilities uh, to um, uh, ignore or uh, pay attention to information. And so this is associated with humans and this is included in ADHD and schizophrenia. And so this um, latent inhibition tends to be one of the tests that if you were gonna be evaluated for uh, especially ADHD, uh, you get tested for your, uh, your latent inhibition. Um, it's in uh, kind of an ecological and animal behavior sense, it's related to predator recognition. So if you're a little tadpole in a pond um, and leaves are falling on your pond, how many times does that have to happen uh, for you to start to ignore that and not react like it's a predator and waste that precious energy? Uh, of course, I wouldn't be talking about it if it wasn't exhibited in honeybees. And what's interesting about, uh, at least in honeybees, is that this variation seems uh, somewhat uh, heritable. So this gets, um, there's, there is some environmental factor, of course, that plays a role in the uh, uh, exhibiting of latent inhibition, but we can select this in reproductives and then we get workers that have similar latent inhibition. And I'm going to I'm gonna to transition to calling this, uh, to abbreviating this to LI because latent inhibition is a mouthful. So you'll hear me call this LI throughout um, the talk. So that's what I mean when I say LI. And um, the assay to test latent inhibition is pretty simple. So what we do is we um, go through a process of familiarization. So um, there's an odor that gets um, uh, puffed at the bee. So we set them up in harnesses and we automate this process of odor being puffed um, at the bee 40 times every five minutes. So they go through an hour and a half um, training session of one odor, and then we take them off of this uh, automated apparatus and put them into a PER station, so proboscis extension reflex. And then we ask that we then associate the, that odor with a, with a reward to see how quickly they learn that odor. And we compare that to a novel odor. So we do a pseudo random order of a novel odor and that familiar odor. So this is kind of the crux of 
um, what we're kind of comparing their ability to um, pay attention to an odor they've already learned is doesn't carry any important information. And then how, comparing that to this novel odor, how quickly do they learn the, this, that novel odor? Um, and uh, the, we do this using the proboscis extension reflex. And so uh, I'll show you a quick video of what that looks like. So this is a bee in a harness and we puff the odor at them and then touch their antenna. They stick their proboscis out and we allow them to, to feed on the, the sugar droplet. And over a couple of trials, um, the question is, does the bee learn? So we turn the odor on and if she sticks her tongue out at just the odor without the sucrose reward, we've confirmed she learns. And we do this um, four times for each odor and we characterize bees um, as uh, exhibiting high latent inhibition, high LI, or low latent inhibition, low LI. So this is what that looks like in learning curve. So over these four trials, um, we have the, uh, the familiar odor is that orange line, um, orange solid line, and that novel odor is the blue dotted line. And individuals that exhibit high latent inhibition, um, are uh, their response to that familiar odor is suppressed, but that response to that novel odor happens very quickly. So they learn the, the novel odor, but they do, not pay, they do not learn that familiar odor because they've already said, hey, that's unimportant information. So that's how we characterize high latent inhibition bees. And then low latent inhibition bees, their learning curves are exactly the same for that familiar odor versus the novel odor. So they, in their brains, they're like, these are both, these are equal. These, I, there's no difference. Even though I've learned this, this um, familiar odor is not associated with anything super interesting. Once it is, they learn it. And so that's how we distinguish our high LIBs and our low LIBs. So we can take, um, let's say, 100 foragers coming, returning from uh, foraging trips, and we throw them into this assay, and we get about 25% of them uh, exhibiting high latent inhibition, and 75% of them exhibiting low latent inhibition. Um, and we, m me as the behavioral ecologist kind of coming into this learning and neurobiology lab, wanted to ask, how does this then translate into relevant B world behavior? So you have this individual variation. Why? Why do we have this? Um, and so I immediately started going to, um, since we're doing this in foragers, um, foragers learn the best in the, in the I should say they learn floral odors the best in the colony, of course, because that's what they're cued in on. Um, nurse bees will learn um, larval odors. And so that's how you can train nurse bees. So I immediately went to foraging. So when we think about foraging behavior, um, I started thinking about the scout bees that are searching for novel and their goal is to ignore familiar, right? So they're going out, those scouts, that job that the scouts have is finding new food um, and bringing that information back to the colony. So they're the explorers. They communicate that information to the recruited bees um, who are the exploiters. So they're the ones who are whose job it is to collect all that food where the, while the scouts should be searching for new food um, when they go out and forage. And so thinking about what this looks like, oh, and, and scout bees versus recruit bees. So the scout bee is the one who does the waggle dance. Um, so she uh, comes in and performs a waggle dance and these bees with their heads oriented toward um, the one doing the waggle dance here in the middle, those are the recruited bees. So they're gleaning that information from her waggle dance. So because scouts must learn to ignore known foraging locations, so they need to say, I'm done with that spot. I've already communicated that information. I need to continue to find new food sources. Our hypothesis was that Latent inhibition is linked to this foraging behavior with scouts being focused on novel, ignoring familiar, they were going to be more high LI and uh, recruits will be unfocused. They're going to learn all odors. We call them unfocused. Um, they're, they're the ones who need to be receptive to um, the familiar, uh, the, to, to continue to be excited about familiar. So they, we predict they would learn all odors and therefore exhibit low latent inhibition. 
So to test this hypothesis, we um, did a pretty typical hive moving assay where uh, one evening we seal up a colony and then we move that four kilometers um, down the road. And then that next morning we open up the colony and on day one, we collect scout bees. Um, and we do this by marking all the bees leaving the hive and we collect them only when they've been gone for at least 10 minutes. So how did I make sure that they were gone for at least 10 minutes? I marked them as they left the colony. So this is a one-way exit. They can't go back into the colony. Um, they can only leave. And as they leave, I um, brush them, um, ideally just their thorax with uh, colored cornstarch. So this is just the colored powder and I mark them pink. Uh, as they're leaving for the first 10 minutes, and then I mark them blue for the second 10 minutes, and then I mark them yellow for the last 10 minutes or for the third 10 minutes, I think I did this, um, six different colors for an hour um, to collect enough bees. And as you can see here, there's no, um, let me get a little, let's see if I can get a laser pointer here. Laser. Um, so the, the colony is closed up. So any bee that has left, um, she's not getting back in. So they're not getting any of that uh, waggle dance information either. Um, and that allows us to collect them. So uh, we did this, we collected scouts. And then um, we, uh, after we were done collecting scouts who had been gone for at least 10 minutes. So remember this, we moved the colony. So they're foraging in a novel, completely novel environment. And then on day two, so after I was done collecting scouts, I open up the colony, allow them to go in and out for 24 hours. And then the next morning at the same time, I come back and I collect bees that are returning uh, as um, recruited bees. And um, uh, I base this off of, so we kind of collected them uh, randomly. And I base this on Tom Seeley's work that showed that about 73% of foragers uh, tend to be recruits. So we collected recruits um, randomly that on day two. And as I mentioned, under the, the undergraduate researchers who worked on this, um, uh, especially Sydney, uh, she was out collecting um, these bees. And we were doing this in Arizona. So this is 115 degrees most days in the summer while we're doing this. So um, Fahrenheit, of course, man, I don't know, Celsius, 45 Celsius. Um, so it was hot. Um, and so uh, she's a boss. So what did we what did we find? So again, we're, we're we're collecting these scouts, we're collecting these recruits, we bring them in, we put them through the latent inhibition assay, so we familiarize them to an odor, and then we use PER to test that their learning ability to the familiar versus a novel odor. And we're using all um, uh, floral odors, constituent floral odors for these tests. So what do we find? Uh, we actually found that scout bees do in fact. Uh, exhibit higher latent inhibition than recruited bees. So they're learning uh, that novel odor um, uh, much more compared to the familiar odor. So a higher number. Um, oh, and sorry, the LI score we calculated as number of responses to novel divided by number of responses to familiar um, plus one on, on both of those uh, on both of those sides. So a uh, number closer to one means an equal response to familiar and novel and a higher number means more responses to novel compared to familiar. Um, and so that's what we found. So scout bees exhibit higher lean inhibition. So our hypothesis was supported. What does this mean? What's going on in their brain? So if we see this, um, the, these uh, behavioral differences um, we're wondering what potentially is going on at the mechanistic level that may be driving these differences. Um, so we did two different um, kind of uh, mechanistic or um, proximate uh, level analyses to try to distinguish what was going on between these scouts and recruits and high LI and low LI bees. And so what we did was we, first we did electrophysiology um, so as we were collecting these scouts and recruits, we brought a subset into the lab. And um, uh, as I mentioned, my colleague Hong Lee, who's a researcher at Arizona State, um, absolute expert in um, electrophysiology. So if you need any advice or want to read his papers, his work is amazing. And so we brought these bees in and we we're able to insert a multi-channel probe into uh, the bees antenna lobe. 
and we get these um, waveforms and these spikes on um, the, the probe actually has 16 different channels that we can read from. So we're doing extracellular electrophysiology, so it's just kind of getting a global view of what's happening in their antennal lobe. And then we performed the, the late inhibition assay. So we started out with one odor, hexanol or octanone, which are the same odors we're using in the behavioral experiments. We do a pretest with uh, one with both of those odors. Then we select one where we do the um, 40 um, puffs of odor over five minutes. And then we do a, a post test um, to evaluate how the, the pre and the post uh, changes with the novel versus the now familiar odor that we expose them to. And uh, so again, Hong and an undergraduate researcher, Eric, did all of these assays. So I'm going to show you. So this is on the along the um, y-axis is the difference. So this is post minus pre. Um, so uh, a um, the like it's the after the familiarization familiarization minus what happened before. Um, so a more negative number means a reduced response uh, compared to um, the the pre uh, test. And I'm splitting this out by scout bees and then the odor that we're testing them on. So what becomes the familiar odor versus the novel odor. So first I'll show you um, what happened with our scout bees. So um, after we did our exposure, those scout bees had a reduced response to our familiar odor. However, they had an enhanced response to the novel odor. So um, after they had gone through the familiarization process, their antennal lobe is much more active when we puff that uh, novel odor at them compared to that familiar odor that they've been pre-exposed to. When we look at recruit bees, we see a suppressed response to both after that familiarization process. Um, and so uh, clearly something is going on kind of in the proximate processing of um, the antennal lobe of the bee. Um, and again, so this is extracellular, extracellular electrophysiology. So this is a global perspective of what's happening. Um, so we don't know the, the finite details um, of this, but we do see a difference. So uh, getting a little bit closer to an answer. And then we wanted to see again, globally in the brain, what could potentially be going on. And so then we did whole brain RNA-seq. So we did these same assays. We, uh, as the bees were landing and returning back to the colony, um, we plunked them into liquid nitrogen and then uh, dissected their brains, extracted their RNA and just did whole brain RNA-seq. Um, and what we found was that after um, the, uh, so upon returning from the colony, so these are just scouts and recruits that are coming back to the colony, um, the gene expression differences are very different. So we only have 381 shared genes um, in the scouts and recruits and scouts and recruits exhibit very different um, gene expression in their brains. Um, and not only do we see very different gene expression, but um, if you look at the log fold change graph, so this is a volcano plot, and with this, the general takeaway I want you to uh, have from this is, so this is recruit, uh, these are scout bees, so this is like recruits to scouts, what happens in scouts compared to recruits, and what we see in scouts is this massive downshift of regulation, uh, downshift regulation of genes in their brain. So um, some important genes in here, we do have some odorant receptors, some neurotransmitter uh, receptors. So some stuff going on here. This is, uh, I'm a behavioral ecologist, but I did get an NIH grant, a NIH postdoc grant to do RNA-seq. Um, RNA-seq is hard, it turns out. There's a lot of data. Um, and so this is kind of broad strokes, but I'm writing a paper right now. Um, and almost done. It'll be out soon showing these differences in these data. So this is pretty new, um, but it should be out soon. Um, RNA seeks fun, but it's hard. Uh, but I'm glad to know it now. Okay, so now we have a little bit of a cue of what's going on in the individual level and then what's going on in the brains of these bees. And of course, we always want to know as, as behavioral ecologists, how does this then scale to collective behavior? Because again, where the rubber meets the road, where the selection happens, 
on the collective? Why, do, why are these bees different? How does this help the colony? Um, so now the rest of my talk will be focused on the collective behavior. Um, there's a lot of data coming, but this was published in PNAS in 2020. Um, at perfect timing in between, uh, like I was interviewing for jobs that hadn't been published. And then I got a job offer in the same like week I got the job offer this got published. And so it was like, you could have, it could have happened a little faster, but yeah, it's my problem for not getting it in earlier. Um, but you know, that's how life works. So thank you PNAS for publishing this anyways. Um, okay. So um, we're still focused on this learning behavior. Um, and so we have, what we did was we had the um, scout, the, the, we, we collected the bees from uh, foraging. So the scouts and recruits, what's happening in their brains and in their behavior. And then we wanted to kind of go the opposite directions. What if we could select um, these high and low uh, phenotypes and then arrange them into colonies to see what happens at the colony. And that's essentially what we did. So um, we were able to select um, these behaviors. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. Okay, so we were, were able to select um, the uh, latent inhibition phenotypes, high LI and low LI. So I'm again, shouting out Jahi, he, he did all of the instrumental insemination for our queens and drones to be able to do this. And his single drone inseminated bees, half of them lived two years, which is kind of unheard of. So he is an epic, uh, <laughs> an epic instrumental inseminator and just a great scientist. Um, so these learning lines by performing this latent inhibition assay on queens and drones. So we, we can actually get queens and drones to learn. Um, so they respond in the proboscis extension reflex. Queens actually very reliably, drones not so much. Drones, you like look at them wrong and they die. So drones are tough to work with, but they do learn. So um, really cool because they're effectively flying gametes. Um, so really cool behavior there. So we can select high latent inhibition um, and low latent inhibition in queens and drones. And then what we did was we took a high LI queen and inseminated her with uh, a high LI drone. And same thing with the low LI. So we had a low LI queen inseminated with a low LI drone. So these are first generation. We just selected them. And then we put them into uh, nucleus colonies. And then we were able, actually a lot of them then transitioned to uh, single deeps. And then we were able to get workers from them. So we reared workers, we brought um, uh, pupa frames in, cap brood in, and allowed them to emerge for a couple of hours. And as they were emerging, we marked them. Um, and uh, it's really great. Another benefit of honeybees is within the first 24 hours of emergence, they can't fly or sting. Um, so it's really easy uh, to mark them and plunk them into uh, bowls lined with uh, Vaseline or with Fluon. So keeps them in the bowl, uh, they don't crawl out and you get nice uh, rainbow bees. Um, so we did that and then uh, before we really dove into making these colonies, we wanted to just make sure that social, the social environment didn't uh, dramatically change um, the learning behavior. Because again, we're assessing this learning behavior um, in, for, in, in foragers, so in bees that are a little bit older. So they're spending a lot of time in the colony. Um, so on the y-axis of this graph, we have LI score. So again, um, number of responses to uh, novel divided by number of responses to familiar. So number closer to one is equal responses, a, num a higher number, more responses to novel, um, fewer responses to familiar. And so what we did was we reared these bees, we had high LI bees um, and low LI bees, and then we either placed them back into their natal colony, so back into their uh, high LI colony for high LI bees, low LI colony for low LI bees, or we had a similarly sized control colony that we uh, placed them all into. Um, they were all age matched, so um, they all went in and then we collected them as foragers um, three weeks later. So we started watching for them. They're all marked, right? So then we're just collecting them as they're returning. We bring them into the lab and we test their LI using the familiarization assay and the proboscis extension reflex. And what we found was that 
Um, bees, oh, and before I move on, so Noah, um, who's a professor at um, UCLA, she was my co-advisor during my postdoc, and then Tiago and Natalie were both postdocs um, with her and um, did a lot of bees, uh, a lot of the analysis for this work. Um, they're fantastic. Um, we, okay, so what did we find? So high LI bees that went back into the high LI colony stayed high. Low LI bees that went back into the low LI colony remained low. And then uh, we saw those uh, responses hold for high LI bees that went into the control colony. They stayed high. Low LI bees um, went that went back into the um, control colony that went into the control colony stayed low. Um, so this was great. So we we're pretty sure that the social environment doesn't seem to impact um, the uh, learning behavior later in their lives. And so then we forged ahead and created colonies. So um, generally these warmer colors tend to be high LI bees. So we reared a bunch of, I think we had 10 high LI, 10 low LI colonies, and we reared bees from all of them. So they're single drone inseminated. So we had a little bit uh, we had to supplement these colonies because we didn't get a ton of brood every week. So we're repeating these assays every week. Um, but we essentially created high LI colonies. We created low LI colonies. All of these have queens as well. And then we did a 50-50 mix. So these are all our 50% um, uh, high, 50% low. Um, and we did have an age match control colony. So we did do the same thing for um, a control colony. So we had four colonies running at a time. And at the B lab at ASU, we had these amazing uh, hoop houses um, that were these flight cages. So we kept the colonies inside for a week and then we placed them outside um, or was it two weeks? Oh my God, now this is what happens when you do, when you're an old scientist, apparently you just forget. So I think it was a week. Um, and then we um, placed them into these uh, the, these flight cages, and we kept them inside because if you if you allow them to forage outside when they go in these flight cages, they just like bonk up against the sides of the cage and kill themselves. So um, they know there's something better out there. Um, so then, so keeping them inside kind of keeps them. Um, uh, unfamiliar to the, what's better out in the landscape. And so then they'll go to your feeders. Um, and so we gave them uh, sugar feeders and we also uh, allowed them to freely forage on water. Cause again, this is summertime in Arizona. Um, so it is uh, 100, 115 degrees Fahrenheit when we're doing these assays. Um, and as the bees visited the feeders, oh no, I'm not there yet, sorry. Um, so what we're, so effectively what we wanna do is replicate this novel and familiar um, landscape, uh, odor landscape that we do in the lab. We wanna replicate this out in the field. And so what we do is we place a familiar feeder in the cage on day one, and we leave that familiar feeder in the same spot we scent it uh, with an odor and it's, uh, it's a specific color. So it stays this color, um, it stays in the same spot, it has the same odor all week long. So day one, colony goes out, familiar feeder goes out. And the bees, are tr the bees find that feeder, every single one of our colonies found that feeder within the first day. And then we um, then place um, novel feeders throughout the week. So. Monday, familiar feeder and colony goes out. Tuesday, feeder X gets added. So familiar feeder still there, but then feeder X gets added. Different scent, different color, different location. Uh, on uh, so Tuesday, Wednesday, feeder Y gets placed. So another uh, novel feeder. Um, again, different scent from X and familiar, different color from X and familiar. And then Thursday, um, they all, the feeder Z got placed. And so again, same thing, uh, completely novel feeder. So the bees, every, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the bees have a choice. And we replicated this uh, over um, the week in each colony, um, or sorry, we had four different cages. We replicated this. So we had a high LI colony, a low LI colony, um, a mixed 50-50 mixed colony and a control colony. Um, and this is where our, my undergrad researchers came in. So I was, I took two, they took two, she took two, it was always a, a girl. And we um, 
we watch these feeders. And as we watch them, we also mark them. So we know what feeders the bees are going to. Um, bees, especially hungry bees, um, when they find these feeders, they are really zoned in on them. And so they, uh, we can touch, touch their little butts with our markers our paint markers, and they don't really mind. So we touch them. And I know that this is the, these two are visiting feeder X because they have a blue dot on their abdomen. And I know this bee was, uh, this is a high LI bee um, reared from our lines. And this is a control bee. So we did supplement those colonies to get them to be a little bit bigger um, to be able to forage normally and regulate temperature effectively. Um, so this is a control bee because she does not have a paint uh, dot on her thorax. Um, so this is what we did. We counted every five minutes. We did um, scan sampling and we marked and recorded who was visiting these feeders every five minutes. And I bought back or every 10 minutes rather, but every five minutes I was in one tent or the other collecting these data at each of the feeders. And these are the, the, the wonderful women that helped me, these two undergrads, Etta and Alexa. Um, Alexa is a, a lab manager now um, at the University of Ar Arkansas, and Etta is a USDA um, lab uh, researcher, lab assistant, and Nisha was a high school student. She came and on day one, I was like, I need an extra set of hands to co like collect data out in, the, in, the, in these tents. Uh, watching bees, are you up to it? She's like, yes. So day one, Nisha, I think she was like 16 years old collecting bee data and she's now a researcher or she's now an uh, undergraduate student at Arizona State. Amazing scientists um, and future scientists. So um, I'm, now we're getting into the data. Okay, so there's a lot of data collection. What did we do to get the, these data? Um, and now I'm going to show you um, the results. So what we uh, this graph is just going to show you um, a cumulative uh, visitation of of each of the the lot the colonies. So high LI, low LI, 50-50 mix, and control colonies. This is just quantifying over the day what does this visitation look like. Um, and this is what we found: the high LI colonies tend to visit uh, the feeders. Um, more, and this is all feeders. This is just all, all the data plunked together. Um, the mix visited right in the middle and the low and control colonies visited um, the least amount. Um, okay, but before I get too into what's coming, um, I just wanna remind you about our prediction. So we predicted that the high LI colonies, just like those high LI um, bees that we test in the lab would prefer novel feeders like they prefer novel odors. So they would exhibit high LI, um, continue to exhibit high LI, more responses to novel uh, and visiting novel feeders. And then the low LI colonies, because they learn everything, they would show no preference and go to whatever feeder. Okay, so now I'm gonna break this down by colony um, and by line. So, um, or sorry, by, by colony, by effectively like the high mixed low and control, and then by feeder rather. So this is the visitation to either the novel or the familiar uh, feeders. And I'm grouping novel all together. So we have three different novel feeders. I'm combining them all together. So this is gonna, these are box plots that you're gonna see. And this is quantifying the number of visits um, to the novel or the familiar feeder by each colony. And what did we find? So I'm gonna start out with the control and low LI. Um, so control colonies, they visited the novel and familiar feeders equally. Uh, the low LI bees also did as well. So they visited the um, familiar and novel feeders equally. So that supports our hypothesis. Uh, what did the high LI bees do? Well, in all science, uh, we always find that our hypotheses are not supported always. So what we found was that the high LI bees actually visit the familiar feeders way more than they visited the novel feeders. So once that feeder got placed, that familiar feeder, and it became reliable, those high LI bees became hyper-focused to it um, and very rarely visited the novel feeders. So what did we find for the 50-50 mixed colonies? Were they more low LI? Were they more high LI? Get out your wallets, folks. What's the bet? Uh, 
they were more, they also were more high ally. So they visited the familiar feeders way more than they visited the novel feeders. Um, so this was a surprise because we were thinking that these high ally bees would be more scout-like. They would be out like exploring the novel feeders, uh, at getting excited about what was new in the, in the field. And that is not what happened at all. They became hyper-focused on old faithful and old reliable. What was cool is that we, um, in these, in uh, our, our um, data recording, we recorded who visited by line. And so um, what we were able to do then is look at the mixed colonies and see um, of the line, of the different lines in these mixed colonies, who was visiting the novel and the familiar feeders. Um, and what we found was that across all of the, the groups, the high, low, and those, those control Bs that we supplemented, again, they were age matched, so everyone's the same age, um, no difference there. Um, those low ally Bs and the control Bs are also visiting, I, sorry, the, um, the legend isn't here, but they're visiting the familiar feeder more, these solid bars. Um, are the familiar feeders. And so they are also now visiting the familiar feeders way more than they're visiting the novel feeders. Um, so we see this shift in behavior even among the lines. And so to summarize that work, um, we found that colonies with different proportions of learning phenotypes behave differently. So we have these colony level properties um, that seem to emerge based on how the individuals are learning. Um, those high ally and mixed colonies um, preferred the familiar feeder, but the straight low ally colonies visited all feeders equally. Um, same with the control, control colonies. In those mixed colonies though, we have the high and low and control bees all showing preference to the familiar feeder. So the question is now, why? Why is that happening? So why do those low allied bees switch feeder preference? Of course, the answer is always for the foraging behavior, right? So what's happening? And so we wanted to then look at the waggle dance. So these bees are going out, they're finding these feeders, and then they're coming back and communicating information about these feeders. Um, and so we wanted to see, is there a difference in communication or receiving that communication based on the lines? So uh, what we did was we, in the, um, uh, the next year, we set up these mixed colonies. So we reared those bees. Um, we set up four mixed colonies we, and we placed them into um, observation, uh, cave, observation um, frames. So we were able to make colonies uh, with glass sides or plexiglass sides and we video recorded their waggle dancing. So as the bees were going out, so remember everyone's marked and so we know who's high, who's low and someone's marking the, the bees, uh, myself or one of my students, we're marking the bees as they're visiting those feeders. Um, so we know who's going out, what feeder they're going to and then we can follow their dances when they come back. And so this is gonna be a stacked bar plot. We're just showing proportion behavior, um, proportion of dancing versus following by line. So we wanted to just characterize who's dancing and who's following based on the line that they come from. And we find that the low ally bees are actually dancing and following way more than the high ally or the control bees, um, but everyone's doing equal proportions of everything. Um, so no one's really being a, a more of a dancer or more of a follower. Um, so really, what is what is driving these differences? So then we looked at proportions of dances followed. So when a dancer came back, we could identify her line, whether she was a low B, low ally, a control B, or a high ally B. And then we just quantified whether that dance was followed by at least one other B. And what we found was that um, so you're going to see another stack bar plot. So proportions of dances followed. Followed it will be in color and not followed is just going to be a black bar. And what we found was that when those high, when those low LIBs come back and they dance, 
there's no, very much more, uh, very more, more of their dances are not followed. So fewer of, of the dances are followed compared to the high line, even the control bees. So when those low ally bees come back and they're so excited about their food, um, they're, nobody cares, which is really sad. Uh, those high ally bees, they're dancing, they're coming back and they're actually exhibiting, they're, they're getting more followers. Um, and so then we wanted to know, what, so again, why, right? Like the behavioral ecologist, well, hi, why is this happening? So when we were video recording these dances, we could um, characterize uh, how intense the dances were. And we characterize that by turns per second. So uh, for each of these dancers, we characterize how many turns they performed in the first 20 seconds of their dance. And what we found was that those high LI bees and the control bees are actually performing more turns per second. So they're dancing more excitedly compared to those low LI bees. Um, so they're, they're, these bees are going out and they're foraging and how they're learning about these, these feeders then translates into the excitement that these bees have about the food. And then the excitement then drives uh, who's visiting what feeder. So because those high ally bees are uh, dancing more vigorously and they have more followers, they urge those bees who are following them to switch feeders. So in those mixed colonies, those high ally bees seem to be telling the low and control bees um, low ally and control bees, hey, go to the feeder that I like, which is the familiar feeder. So we think that this is a pretty complete story in terms of behavior. Of course, there's so much more to be done um, in terms of, you know, like what happens. These are all the same uh, quality of food source, right? So what happens if you start messing with food quality and give them different, like better versus worse? Do they make those switches? Are high ally bees better at making those switches than low ally bees? We don't know. Um, so lots of work to still be done. So just to kind of broadly conclude um, this latent inhibition and uh, behavior, what we think is going on, um, we think that late inhibition, we, we went into this thinking that it would be novelty seeking, that those high ally bees are actually getting excited about novelty, but we actually think it's more about attention and paying attention and becoming hyper-focused on something compared to ignoring familiar information. So it's really that incoming, what do they get excited about? And in uh, psychology literature, this is actually called conditioned attention theory, um, that it's not about ignoring, but it's more about how these bees, how the individuals, not just bees, but in this case bees, are able to focus their attention. Uh, the high ally bees are really good at focusing on what's important, and that is food, and that is reliable food. So they're like, this is fine. Once I find this, I'm sticking with it. Those low ally bees readily learn everything, and so they're more willing to switch and then uh, potentially just like follow whoever is saying like, this is where we want to go, right? So it's like your friends when you're picking a, a, a restaurant to go eat dinner at, um, you can go to Old Faithful, right? If you have a vocal friend that's like, oh, we got to go. This is our favorite. We, it's reliable. We know it versus the other friends who are like, I'm willing to try anything. Then the, those more vocal friends dictate where the group goes. Um, and so this, this attention ultimately translates into uh, dance enthusiasm. So we think this is a pretty cool story. Um, and uh, so overall, again, uh, just as Christoph mentioned in the beginning in the introduction, this is really what dictates my work is this individual um, behavior or a small group behavior, what's going on in their brains that dictate these behaviors, and then how does that potentially translate up into collective behavior. So I did this with foraging um, during my postdoc, and now as a new professor, I'm uh, getting back to my PhD work and now working, reintegrating uh, thermoregulation and fanning behavior. So we're doing this exact work, um, and we're integrating some uh, microbial work um, and uh, some more strict physiology, looking at receptors and uh, perception of the bee. So really excited to continue this trajectory and this philosophy of my work. And of course, we're still studying collective behaviors. And um, I think again, like whether we're talking bacteria or we're talking humans or every organism, even plants in between, um, I think this type of uh, analysis doing this 
um, multi-level analysis can really help um, answer some of these really cool questions about collective behaviors and get this holistic, um, have this holistic approach. So with that, thank you all so much for uh, listening to this talk. Um, this is all my contact information. If we don't um, you know, get to your question um, or if you wanna follow anything up, um, I would absolutely love to chat. Um, follow me on Twitter. There's my email, you got everything. So thank you all so much. Thank you very much um, for these very interesting findings. Um, do we have any questions? I do, may I ask one? Yes. Hey, Margarita. Hi, Chelsea. It's great to see you. Good to see you too. And, and uh, I have a question. Uh, if you probably could return to the slide where you looked at the electrophysiology of uh, high LI, low LI. Yep. And uh, I have a question about the mechanistic of this uh, uh, finding. So you found that uh, low LIBs uh, were equally kind of unresponsive to hexanol and, uh, uh, and uh, octanol. So, so we found that the recruit bees were. So we didn't uh, we didn't directly test their LI. So this is these are recruit bees that we're calling them recruits as they're returning back to the colony. So we we are characterizing these bees by their foraging behavior. And again, like of course we've linked recruit bees. They tend to be more low LI, but this is not based on LI. It's just their foraging behavior. But yes, generally the recruit bees they both have. Uh, equally statistically equally suppressed responses or activity in their antennal lobe compared to uh, that scout bee novel uh, re response to the novel odor. Yeah, uh, my question is if uh, you happen to test antennal sensitivity without involving the actual antennal lobe, uh, whether uh, the difference is maybe in uh, some kind of uh, chemical ecology mechanism and something like they have a defector receptor for one of these orders or the orders are coded in the antenna in a different way from uh, the scout bees. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, so thinking about like, is there, there could potentially be I mean, it could be different numbers of re receptors, defective receptors or some. So I guess the odors, it didn't really matter what odor it was. So I wonder if there's like some, um, to, to, to me that would still indicate some higher level um, like processing that goes on that filters that information in some way or changes the physiology in some way based on that, that I don't know if it's still approximate kind of like, you know, antenna or antenna lobe, um, like receptor thing, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, uh, so I would like to follow up on this question uh, with like, uh, first of all, uh, you switched between the familiar and the unfamiliar, right? So one time it was familiar hexanol, unfamiliar octanol, and the other time it was the other way. Exactly. Okay, so that partly answers the question. Yeah. Uh, and uh, another question is, do you think you would, like, would you try to do the same with visual learning as, as opposed to olfactory learning? Yeah, I, that's such a good, yeah. I think that um, when we characterize these animals um, and because we see these differences in their, like, you know, their, the, the gene expression, um, these scouts and recruits, they are, they are paying attention to, to information differently. And so I think it, it probably spans di the, the sensory, um, sensory reception. I would, I would guess that it would be visual as well. Yeah. It's a okay. great question. Yeah. Yeah. That would be very interesting to test. Uh, Absolutely. And, uh, because when you show that like uh, it's conditioned attention, uh, so it's, uh, they, are more attentive to something that's important. And uh, then uh, what is important is usually learned, right? Because for one colony, one exactly. thing is important, for another colony, other thing is important. Absolutely, uh, exactly. 
So, the, so the, it would be interesting to test it in different sensory modalities and probably also for different resources, right? To exclude like the some exactly uh, like dumb mechanistic, uh, you know, uh, explanations. That, Absolutely, uh, Margarita. Let's collaborate. Let's do this. Let's answer these questions. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. Thanks for those great questions. So, so good. Yeah, okay. I have to run now, but thank you so much for your amazing- Good to see you. Awesome. Yeah, and good to see you. Okay, we have see another question by, by Tegan. Hey, Tegan. Hi. Hi, Dr. Cook. Thank you so much for sharing this really, really cool work. Um, Thanks. Yeah, so I was actually very interested in your interpretation of within group spread. Um, both within um, high LI and low LI, and then within, um, although, you know, kind of mapping onto that, um, scout and recruit, if you've looked at, yeah, if there's some um, value in having greater plasticity um, within these groups. Oh, that is such a good question. And that, so we, we do think that, um, the um like there is some plasticity right and there's some there are of course like with heritability when we think about gene uh by environment interactions right and what actually leads to uh the phenotypes that we see um i do think there is some plasticity and um we haven't done a lot with like consistency of the behavior over time like because we test foragers and foragers, we, we do floral odors. And so foragers are the ones like, if, if you collected nurse bees and tested them on these like floral odors, they don't learn very well. And so for a long time in the literature, it's like, oh, bees, nurse bees don't really learn that well, but it turns out if you just give them what's biologically relevant for them, like the like larval odors or disease odors, nurse bees learn really well. Um, and so we, as far as I know, there's not a lot of consistency in terms or not a lot of work done on consistency. So whether these bees retain their high li or low li status over time, um, or like whether environmental shifts could potentially influence that. Um, so it'd be, that would be a really great direction to look into. Um, we, of course, we did a little bit of that. And this, this, this graph kind of indicates that. Um, but there is, there's a lot of spread, right? So there's a lot of different uh, phenotypes and how we characterize um, this particular learning behavior. And we don't know even what it potentially could also like correlate with, like what else are we selecting when we select this late inhibition behavior? So um, yeah, really good thought. I hope that kind of answers your question because um, there's, there's a lot of directions to go with this work for sure. Yes, thanks Dr. Cook. Of course. I guess in, in some environments, it would really make sense to be plastic, especially if you're in an environment where you have a lot of turnover then, um, or whether that changes where you have certain stationary periods where not much changes, and then you suddenly find yourself in an environment with a lot of turnover that you want to be pl plastic in the degree of um, your latent inhibition. Exactly, Christoph, that's exactly right. And so I think like the, like, the proportion of latent inhibition, um, like it, the proportion of bees, like if it is fixed, right? This is what's kind of cool about the different levels of like whether this is a group behavior and individual behavior, the colony level phenotype could potentially be the same regardless of whether it's a, like a like solidified genetic phenotype or not, because the colony could be responding and, and um, something about the um, development or who, which, what workers end up like becoming adults, um, whether they're higher LI or low LI, that allows the colony to kind of be flexible um, in terms of what they're foraging for. Do you, if you want more, if everything that's blooming right now is all the same and that's the new, like information that's coming into the colony, like similar odor, similar nutrition, you might want more high LI bees. Right, and that could that information could make more high LI bees, or the colony could make more high LI bees because of that. 
versus if you want, if, if everything was different, like right now in Milwaukee, everything's blooming, right? And so you want a lot of flexibility and you can do that individually or you could do that collectively and have more like low LIVs to be more flexible and be more like, you know, searchy or what have you. Yeah, so pretty interesting. And again, uh, we, we, we define this we were like these high LIBs, they seem to become really focused on the familiar and what's reliable. But again, like if something changes, like if one, if something is like we did one molar concentration sucrose, if it's like 1.5, maybe those high LIBs are ready to go elsewhere. Um, so we kept, this is really just scratching that like the tip of the iceberg in terms of what this means in like, you know, colony level um, flexibility, I think. Yeah, great thoughts, great questions. I love it. Do we have other questions? Oh, so I think we yeah. have a question in the chat. Yeah, there's one in the chat. Maybe you read it, um, Chelsea, because it's, sure. a, it's a long one and it's two questions. I love it. Okay, so uh, do you think the receptors of the dance, and this is from uh, Joaquim? Uh, cool. Um, you think the receptors of the dance would suffer pressure uh, to kind of ignore the more excited dances in order to save energy from foraging to non-reliable or no like novel or temporary food sources that would in fact overexcite the high allied dancer. So in the, are you, Joaquim, are you saying like in the colony, like would there potentially be maybe like stop signals to like, hey, like we, we've already been there, like we get it kind of thing, like enough, we get it. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that um, I mean, like um, there's definitely been, of course, like um, James Nye's work on stop signals and like what when they happen, um, I, we didn't see them. Of course, we didn't look explicitly to see if that was happening, but I do think, of course, like we don't want this like positive feedback loop to get out of control. So there probably is some like, feedback that that stops the like okay we've exploited that source so that actually might be another um we we constantly kept the feeders going right so we were refilling them throughout the day um but if we uh if those feeders became empty how do they switch that's such a good question i like that a lot um and then your second question do you think the frequency of novel stimuli appearance could affect the susceptibility receiver to novel information like uh, if they would only really pay attention to new food source after it's been there for some time and reported for this uh, some number of foragers so again I think you're thinking of these tipping points right like what uh, how many foragers like the the like how many dances do they need to see to get them to that tipping point of paying attention that's again an, another excellent question we didn't quantify that um, but I think when we, when we did this work, we didn't see a lot of switching. So that was one of the things that we thought we would see a lot more of. So we're marking the bees at their abdomens as they're visiting the feeders, right? And so we were like, we're going to see rainbow bees. They're going to be all different colors and their little butts are going to be all different colors. We, in every trial we did, we would maybe get one bee that would be like that. And so we didn't see very many of these like total like free form like all we're going to go to every single feeder um we did do fridays so i mentioned monday tuesday wednesday thursday fridays we actually put all the feeders out to see who would pick what so we have that data so like if a if a novel be picked the novel feeders throughout the week do, when they have everything which feeder do they go to like was it the most recent or do they have a favorite we have all that data not published, not even looked at, right? So science, this is what we do. It's just collect way too much data. So good questions, Joaquim, I love it. Um, I wish I had better answers, but pure speculation at this point. <laughs> good questions. Um, so there's one thing that I still confuses me a bit. And yeah. so you use the classical scout assay to identify scouts. Yes. And then you found that these scouts are high LI bees and assumed from this that this is kind of indicative of scouting. Yes. And then in the 
feeder experiment, it's kind of you find exactly the opposite of what you would expect from a scout, which is yes. they have a strong tendency to go back to their food sources. So exactly. it, in my head, that kind of doesn't go together. So I know. Does, it, does it mean that maybe the, the classic scout assay that lots of people are using, does it mean that it maybe doesn't identify scouts? Or does it mean that the LI score isn't a good measure for whether you're a scout? Or how do you put these things together? Ah, that's such a good question. That's exactly the frustrating part. Like when you get, when you, your hypothesis isn't supported, it's oftentimes cooler, right? You're like, oh, this is, I'm, oh man, I have my pet hypothesis. Of course we shouldn't, but we do. And you're like, damn, this doesn't match up, but it's almost cooler in that way. So I think uh, both of those answer, both of those options you gave are correct. I think that the way that we define both scouting and latent inhibition, latent inhibition, I think that those definitions are um, are not all encompassing, right? They're not as as holistic or as uh, the clearly these behaviors are much more complex than our simple definitions want them to be, right? And so I think it's also what we what we call different behaviors in the field versus what we call behaviors in the lab. In the lab, we control the odor, right? We control the bee, she's in a harness, she's stressed, she's isolated. And we, that's the, the how we're defining her behavior in the lab, right? So I think that's so different than what, what we do in the field. And I think that's why, in, in my opinion, um, it's really important to go back and forth, right, and have that kind of dialectic between the the what we do in the lab when we can control everything versus what we do in the field when we can't control anything, um, where we can control even you know much less than what we do in the lab. So I think that what like what is a scout be? Is it something we were coming from it like they they love novel, right? Mm -hmm. But really, in in the bee world. Um, it is beneficial, well, I guess, again, it depends on the environment, but it's whatever is, whatever is giving you food, if things are giving you food, why switch, right? This is optimal foraging. Like, what's the point of switching if this is giving you food? And so I think that um, those high ally bees or the scout bees, if things are reliable and there's really nothing else in the environment that that is that much more exciting. Again, in, the, in this tense, we're just giving them feeders with sugar water, yeah. right? It's not like flowers with colors and strong odors and mixed odors, right? Um, so I think that like, you know, what we're doing and what we're defining, what we're controlling, I think, you know, what like are, do the bees care? Do the bees pay attention? Um, I think the downstream effects when we do hold everything equal, I still think that those high ally bees or those scout bees, when they find something, they still have that impetus to dance more, right? And they dance more vigorously. So that translation of what's important to the colony scales up much faster in those scout bees or in those high ally bees than, the, than those low ally bees. So in the learning side of things, there's a, it's very muddy, but then how that learning and how that attention scales to shape what's going on in the colony, those high ally bees, those scout bees are the ones really dictating still what's going on. So kind of a long-winded answer, but of course, and of course not really an answer, just more of a like, you know, let's do a like a brain experiment here, but um, really it's cool, right? Like what, what, what is a scout? What's mm -hmm. high ally? How do these match up? Or are they just on different axes? Like do they kind of co like correlate together? Wh how do these axes play out of like what matters to these bees? Yeah, I love it. It's cool. Yeah. Axel. Yeah, okay, good. I'm switching topics. I'm um, interested <laughs> in your RNA seq. I'm interested oh. in your RNA seq. Uh, oh, God. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so, so the first question is. Because there's this paper uh, by Sophia Liang, right? The science yeah. paper. And uh, I would like to know whether kind of like your data are matching with, the, with, with uh, those they do. Uh, of that paper. They do, yep. Yeah, and they so do? what we, yep, yep. And we, what, what I did, 
so the paper that is coming out is looking at not only the scouts and recruits just collected from the colony, but then we bring them into the lab and we run, run them through the LI assay. And we, so we have scouts and recruits before, so just collected at the colony, and then scouts and recruits after the LI assay. So similar to what we did with electrophysiology, but with RNA-seq. And we see when we do these assays, so not only, they're different before, they become even more divergent after the, the latent inhibition assay. So that's also kind of what we're asking is like, what changes in the brains of these bees after they go through this assay? And those scouts and recruits, they diverge even more. So the, the initial, the just what, what's going on with these scouts and recruits, it does match up with what uh, Leong and Gene Ro like coming out of Gene Robinson's lab did, absolutely. Okay, and then, um... So, so this is only one volcano plot, no? And that yes. you show it. And, oh yeah. Um, so, um, do you see it in different colonies the same? I mean, did you test scouts from Good different question. colonies? And we did. did uh, colony uh, replicates. Yes, when we did. So when I did the the DE seq analysis, we you we treat colony as we have that as a as a an effect i don't i don't know exactly if it's called a random effect in that analysis like it would be in like a glm but we do uh treat that as an effect i haven't looked into it because i think we actually only did two colonies so we did uh two high and two sorry two scout and two colonies for scouts two colonies for and they're the same colonies so we did this twice and just in two different colonies so not many not not a ton yeah so I yeah. think, and I got to say, if, if this is replicable, that yeah. um, this kind of like that, the recruits show a higher kind of expression, kind of higher number of kind of higher expressed uh, genes. And it yep. seems to be that they are uh, uh, downregulated in scouts. Whether this could mean, I mean, so could be the question, who is the regular bee, right? right. And, 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 um, so, and maybe the, the recruits are the regulars and then kind of it, a lot of what they do is kind of down-regulated. I mean, this is a little bit too metaphorical speaking, but. Uh, no, I mean, I think, could... you know, when we like through, through, sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, I think the, through Tom, Tom Seeley's work and everyone who's worked on scouts and recruits, right? We do see more recruit type bees, right? We see more um, bees that, are uh, will will spend more of their life and a, a bigger part of their life as just bees that follow the waggle dances or just go out and forage, right? And so that I do think that in terms of you know foraging strategies, you want more bees doing the ex exploitation, right? We don't we don't want a ton of explorers. Because that's you know you they could be flying around for hours they could be wasting energy you want bees that are just going to to the reliable continue to be excited about the reliable and collect all the as much food as possible and that's also what we've selected in European honeybees right it's just like exploit and collect um, so yeah I think that's probably part of you know what we've selected for and what uh, we like about the bees right when we when when Almond pollination happens here in the U.S. and California, and all there is is all, our almond flower. All there are is almond our almond flowers. Grammar, man. Uh, that you want those bees to just be like first almond flower of the day and last almond flower of the day. You want them to be excited about it, right? Um, so I think that's also probably part of the selective pressures that we've put on honeybees in particular. Um, to be like this. And so I think that's also a question to ask in other bees or ants, like what have we, what, you know, what, what genes get turned on to be those exploiters, those massive exploiters compared to the explorers. Yeah, and so what would you think would be, um, so if, if one would go on an evolutionary thing, so, yeah. so one would have kind of like solitary bees. So, oh. So what do you kind of think that the solitary bees are more like the scout type or probably, right? Yeah, and, and I would think so. Kind of like the recruits, right? Absolutely, yeah, that would be, that's my first instinct, yeah, is that they would definitely be more the, the scout type. 
Absolutely. Yeah, interesting, yeah. right? Ah, that's On cool. the other hand, I would think that it's if you found a good food source, um, there's always a good reason to go back there because you found oh. it and yep. you know where it is and you know whether it's dangerous or not and you know what kind of reward that you're getting. And I guess for me- Until it's no scouting, longer there, right? Yeah, so, but the scouting for me would always be the backup option if yeah. you're an individual bee. So the, the first thing that I try, if I liked it, I go back to the same place. And yeah. only it's, if it's not there, I start to, to scout and look for something new. Do you think there are data on that for solitary species? But then kind of like they, they will be kind of collectors for, for, the, uh, for the nest, right? So Yeah, I, I mean, think, I think uh, Sandra Rehan, I think and her student Wyatt have done some of this, these trade-offs of, of foraging, but I know that they do like they compare, like they're doing uh, a lot of Sandra's work is in the small carpenter bee. And so they're, they're doing like moms and daughters and kind of the trade-offs of like who, who is foraging versus guarding um, when their like kind of division of labor happens. And they're, I guess, like semi-social, right? Like sub-social. Um, okay, so yeah. If you do a GO analysis on your data, what kind of like, what comes up? Oh. Man, <laughs> we did, we do have that. Um, the, the, it's a lot, honestly. So it's funny when we do individual, um, when we are doing individual gene expression and just doing these broad characterizations like volcano plots, um, we didn't have a ton of neurotransmitters come up. And then when we do individual, just like uh, box plots. So I'm thinking of Christoph, your paper um, on the, uh, individual versus social information paper. Um, when you look at like the, those just comparing kind of like box plots to, of expression of particular genes, a lot of neurotransmitter genes, a lot of odorant receptor genes pop out of this too. Um, so where they get cater ca uh, categorized in go terms, <laughs> man, I'm, oh, I'm not an oh. expert on it, but yeah. So I think, yeah, the go term stuff, um, we see a lot of that, the neurotransmitters and kind of odorant receptors popped up, pop up on those. How about, about metabolic genes? Sorry for asking you. Um, so. Heat shock proteins pop up in terms of like the metabolic kind of stressor um, genes. Which one in particular are you thinking of? I don't, I don't think of the no, I was kind of thinking of um, just maybe the, that general category. Mitochondrial genes yeah. for energy. Are, are producing right so if you think that um oh yeah 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 so the the i mean the brain is one of the most energy uh, um needing kind of uh, uh tissue or organ and and whether there's something that is different between recruits and and, and scouts yeah oh well, that's a good that's a really good question and i think also you know thinking about our electrophysiology we didn't i don't think you know when we do whole brain analysis we were avoiding optic lobes and antennal lobes. So, but just thinking about the electrophysiology too, if you have, if you have more activity in your antennal lobe, um, potentially even antennal lobes would be, um, would have differences as well. If we need, if we have more activity happening there in those neurons uh, for the scout bees, for the novel behavior compared to familiar too. Interesting, I love it. Oh my God, this is great. Oh my God, so much science, so much like, I love this. this is the best part of what we do, I think, is just getting to brainstorm about really cool work. Um, do we have any questions? Otherwise, I have one for the time being. So yeah. when you compared the dance intensity, you looked at the kind of the frequency that they um, perform wackle runs per time unit. Yes. You also look at my kind of first thought would have been look at probability of dancing and the duration of the dances as an explanation for having more recruits. And I yes. was just wondering, um, did you look, did you measure the total number of waggle runs per dance or the duration in seconds? Um, or maybe also the probability that they 
performed dances where they're overall maybe more dances performed by LI, high LIDs? So I, I think so this, this proportion is kind of getting at not quite probability, but I think this can be thought of like who's doing, like if we just treat it as a binary, like if they're dancing or if they're following. Um, I guess we do have total number of Bs no, I think that's where we got these from is like total number of bees. We know how many would be in there. So this is kind of like that. But then, yeah, so we did this. These data are turns per second. So this is just in 20 seconds. How many? And this is also not the full waggle dance. So I've, I'm, I uh, forgot to mention this, but because we're in these flight cages, they're doing the round dance. So we were doing like how many times they kind of switch directions while they're yeah. doing the round dance. So we didn't have the full waggle runs because it's just these, you know, like we're talking yeah. like maximum like 30 feet. So they're not doing, you know, the full waggle dance. Um, so that's what we did. And we, we didn't do full duration because it was, oh my God, I know I'm trying to remember this. This is like years ago. The, we didn't, we did look at duration. The reason why we didn't do it is because it ends up being very like, um, like lots of short dances. And then you have a couple of individuals from ev everyone. So I don't think there was any line that did this more than the other who just danced for like minutes. Like mm -hmm. you're just like, most of them are like a, about a minute long or something, or, you know, 40, 30, 40 seconds. And then you have some bees that just like, we watched them for like 10 minutes just dancing. Yeah. Right? So I think that it was like super, like, so that kind of skews the data. And so I think that's why we just decided like, what in the bees, like what is kind of like the average time, I think it ended up being around 30 or 40 seconds. And then, so we were like, so everyone seems to be dancing, you know, around at least 20 seconds. So how many turns per second do they do in that first, you know, 20 seconds, which is why we ended up there. That's yeah. a really good question. I love, that's a very, yeah. Like, I think we did, I, I can't, I can't exactly tell you how many different analyses we did for this. I'm sure we did all I of them. Imagine, yeah. I, I was just yeah. curious, I, I would guess that maybe they may have also danced a little bit longer since they maybe were more excited anyway, but yep. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, it didn't, I think there was no, I do remember, man, well, I'll have to look back at the paper too. I think we do have average dance, uh, like length. And I, I, man, I couldn't tell you if it was different, but yeah. I think it's in the paper. I think it's in the paper. <laughs> it's so funny when I, when I was like just first starting as a PhD student and when like like I was talking to, you know, professors and they would be like, I can't remember exactly what I did. I'll have to look back at the paper. I was like, how can you do that? These are like your pet projects that you love and you do. And then look at like, now I'm like <laughs> doing that. Like, I can't remember. Yeah. I did, I spent four years of my life doing this. I'm like, so funny. Yeah. So I, I do, I'm pretty sure the average, at least the averages are in the paper, the probability now I'm feeling a little silly because uh, I do probability of fanning, like when we do our fanning assays, that's like a, the main metric of fanning. And now I'm like thinking back, I'm like, why didn't I do probability of dancing? Could pro I probably did that too, but yeah. Good questions. I love it. Um, and maybe you remember, maybe you did this, whether you look <laughs> at the sucrose response thresholds of these bees of the air. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. We published uh, a, a colleague of mine, um, Meg Bennett. Uh, we did some electrophysiology with high LI and low LI uh, bees. So not scouts and recruits, but low LI and high LI and no difference in sucrose responsiveness okay. between high LI and low LI. Yep. Yeah. It was one of the first things we did. Yeah. Okay. No difference. Yeah. Right. I, I have a question. Um, I'm a beekeeper from from hey, New Anthony? York State. <gasps> Where and, in New York? Uh, uh, upstate New York near Where? Albany. Cool. I'm from uh, Rochester. Oh, yeah. I grew up in Buffalo. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Western uh, New York represents. Central. Yeah. I went to school in Cortland. Got, I'm sorry, I did my undergrad. Uh, 
So uh, as a beekeeper, you know, when I, uh, I'm listening to some of these sessions, uh, I'm always asking myself, what is the takeaway of this research for a beekeeper and how will it help them manage or improve management of their hives? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you see a lot of, uh, you know, your research must be affected by seasonal changes to the hive, whether there's dirts or uh, Absolutely. Other, other things ha happening. Uh, and so what can a beekeeper focus on and to try to improve situations so that they're always, the bees are always optimized at the highest level, like you saw in your research. And uh, so that's yeah. my question. That's a great, that's such a great question. So I would say um, it depends on what, what, you're doing as a beekeeper. Um, if you have your colonies and they hang out at your house and you're collecting honey from them, um, selling honey, um, I think that the number one thing that you can do is have genetic diversity and have healthy bees that make it through winters and that you're not just constantly buying packages, um, buying queens from California, buying packages from Georgia. Um, having regionally healthy stocks, I think, is really important for honeybees. So do you see uh, there's now a push, at least in the U.S., for beekeepers to consider, you know, uh, supplemental feeding of, of pollen or even probiotics? So uh, what would you say about some of that? Yeah, I think it, we supplemental feed. So I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin now. So very similar to, you know, central New York and we supplemental feed. Uh, we, the reality is, is that most of us keep bees in, um, you know, uh, areas that have been developed, whether for agriculture, or for, you know, human, for like, you know, housing. Um, so I think that the reality is, is that our bees aren't getting as much nutrition as they need from what's available. And so we supplemental feed, we do mostly sugar. We will do some pollens if they take it, but most of the time they don't. Um, so we definitely, we, we do what we need to do to keep our bees alive, right. And keep them healthy. And we overwintered, uh, 93%. So I think we had, I think we have like 25 colonies ish and I we got 93 percent through winter too so I think whatever you need to do I think treating for mites have to treat for mites you have to do mite washes do alcohol washes keep track of your mites treat for mites supplemental feed if you need to and get them through winters that's the number one thing I think Anthony yeah yeah because I you know years ago I've been a beekeeper uh, before my uh, beard turned wa white. <laughs> yeah. But uh, nowadays they're being classified, and maybe rightly so, as livestock. Yeah. And so if you look at the history of livestock, you know, they've always been, uh, there's been supplemental feeding and Absolutely. looking at stressors and everything else in them in order to even feed probiotics. So Absolutely. it just seems like that's the direction beekeeping is going. Uh, and so uh, I, I found the talk very, very interesting. And, Great. Uh, I, I, I worked for the New York State Health Department in my awesome. working years. And so, uh, you know, uh, we were involved in a lot of different uh, research on on things, but uh, these great. series, these talks that have been given in this series are really, you know, stretching my mind to, to you know, remember things back when, when I was doing more work like it, but I, uh, absolutely, not many beekeepers seem to uh, ever be on these sessions, and it's more research oriented, but I do appreciate you providing these for me. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, absolutely. 
I think the more diverse groups that we can have interested in just general science. I mean, a lot of a lot of this is, you know, general basic biology. We're trying to, at least for this work that I just presented, we're just trying to figure out kind of basic, like why why are bees different, right? Why do we see these differences in, in individual bees and at the colony? Um, but then if we can make any of our work, one, if we can communicate our work effectively to everyone, and two, make our work applicable to help beekeepers. Um, I think that's, you know, ultimately a lot of our goals. So yeah, this is, it's super important. Yeah. So yeah, Christoph and Axel for organizing this. this is so great. Good, good crowd, good turnout. Thank you. I think this is an area where you have a bit of an, where beekeeping and basic science can meet because we're in- 100% in how honeybee colonies are successful, how they can forage successfully in certain types of environments, how they can maybe also over time um, show behavior that is locally adaptive. And of course, this very often collides with beekeeping practices, like shipping bees around from one area to a very different one. And this kind of makes it difficult for populations to adapt to local conditions. Exactly, and I think even if you look at what we do here in the US where we ship packages everywhere, we truck bees across the country versus like even Canada here in North America, we have like, you're not allowed, last I knew, I laws can change, but last I knew, you're not even allowed to bring like bees across province borders, right? And so very different beekeeping practices, country by country, even here in the US um, or state by state in the US, but even in North America, what Canadian beekeepers do versus what American beekeepers do. And Anthony, I think getting to your point of why we, why we need to, in the US at least, treat honeybees as more of, an, of, a, of, a, of livestock is because it's how we're treating them, right? There are they're factory farmed at this point, right? Like they are, when you go out to California during almond production, you have, um, you know, these like feedlots of bees. They're just, the air is thick with bees. It's wild and they're spreading disease and spreading mites and, you know, it's, it's wild. Um, okay. Any other last questions? If not, then I would say I stop recording.